We have seen numerous protests around the world this year. Hong Kong, Iran, Lebanon and Sudan, just to name a few. Although civil unrest is nothing new, it is evolving. So what has changed and how are governments dealing with it? I am Sushira Maguire from BBC Monitoring. This is what has been happening in the past year. 2019 has been an extraordinary year in so many ways and civil unrest is one trend worth keeping an eye on. There's been a massive human and economic cost to the unrest and quite a few political casualties too. So what do these protests have in common? Let's have a closer look. In almost every case, there's been a trigger, a single grievance which spirals into something much bigger. The trigger could be something large, like an election, or something that seems quite small, like a rise in train fares, or a tax on WhatsApp. These triggers always tap into wider frustrations about cost of living, equality or political representation. In many ways, the template for the modern protest movement was set almost a decade ago in Iran. Remember the protests against the controversial election in 2009? This is when we first noticed the power of social media on the streets. It really helped to organize protests and expose state brutality. It was clear that conventional methods of suppressing unrest were no longer working. Twitter has been blocked in Iran ever since, and Iran has proved quite adept at limiting social media over the years. Two years ago, the messaging app Telegram was blocked after protests erupted nationwide. This year, when unrest broke out over fuel price rises, the government came up with a near-total internet takedown, which lasted about a week. And that, I must say, is a very effective way to control the narrative. Internet shutdowns are a reactionary measure. Uh, they're taken in times of crisis because authorities think that they'll help but uh, often it has the reverse effect of what authorities want. This actually amplifies because the world cares more, in some cases, about the shutdown than they do about the original scandal. Iran's leaders also have another tool. They control all TV and radio stations. So when the internet went down, a media campaign kicked into gear. Protesters were made to look like rioters working for Iran's foreign enemies. آشوب طلبان سازمان یافته مسلح برنامه ریزی شده و کاملا بر مبنای برنامه ای که A similar strategy was used by Chinese state media in their coverage of the protest movement in Hong Kong. But with technology at the heart of the movement, protesters were able to show the world what was happening. This also meant that the movement could go on without leaders. Chat apps like Telegram play the vital role in organizing large gatherings. But of course, the authorities also had their hands on the very same chat apps and even tried to expose demonstrators through the technology loopholes. The protest movement in Hong Kong is the most live-streamed in history, and this has probably restricted China's ability to act. In Iraq, the protests initially demanded more jobs, better public services, and to end corruption. But the dynamics have changed and they are now calling for a complete overhaul of the political system. The internet, again, plays a significant role. And again, the authorities cut it. Iraq suffered uh, the most serious loss of life we've tracked in any country since uh, we started monitoring. We have reason to connect the internet shutdowns there directly with the loss of life. We saw an impact in the region of, of 40 million uh, USD uh, per day during parts of this shutdown which is very significant again, and when you consider that large parts of that are coming from the pockets of the people. After almost two months, the Prime Minister Adil Abdul Mahdi resigned, but the grievances remain. Nearly 9,000 miles away, we've seen similar patterns in Chile. When the government announced new subway fares, things went horribly wrong. A 30 peso increase is not a big high really, especially when Chile is the richest country in South America. But together with frustrations over shortcomings in public services and high level of inequality, the demonstrations quickly turned violent. Protesters also turned their anger on TV news because they felt coverage was biased and contained false information. Fake news was also prevalent on social media, where the dark days under General Pinochet were often evolved as the troops were sent onto the street. As well as Iraq's Prime Minister, Lebanon's Saad Hariri stepped down, as did Algeria's President Bouteflika, and Sudan saw off President Bashir after nearly 30 years in charge. In fact, 
Sudan offers an interesting case study in how these movements develop. The protests started over the price of bread. Social media was quickly blocked, but protesters did not give up. After Bashir fell, they continued to demand change. The mass killing of protesters in June showed the dangers that they still face. But there are also signs of progress. In November, Sudan revoked the law that controlled how women act and dress in public. This was the key demand of the protesters. Just like elsewhere in the world, young people and women were at the forefront of the movement. The internet was a key tool for protesters and a threat to leaders. Not to forget fake news, which grows at times of chaos and unrest. But what can we expect in the future? In 2020, we're going to see more severe forms of targeted censorship. We're going to see targeting by demographic. We're going to be seeing shutdowns based on who people are, not necessarily where they live, as we see more fine-grained controls. We're going to see the technology advance, but also technology to monitor these disruptions. Thanks for watching. If you are interested in tracking civil unrest around the world, check out our website at monitoring.bbc.co.uk and don't forget to hit subscribe.